Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. I'm Daryl. I'm an alcoholic. Hey, Daryl. Hey, Daryl. And I am really, like, mixed between resentful and grateful that the Warriors are playing tonight. Because I can't decide whether I want to be the center of attention or if I, like, want to be alone in this room. So, actually, I'm, I'm kind of grateful it's thinned out, but yet I'm still exceptionally nervous to be speaking in front of this group, is this venue. Something about it seems like, whoa, you know, the mic and everything like that. And, you know, I'm, I'm self-centered, so it's easy for me to go into fear really, really quickly and forget that all I really am is a recovered alcoholic that only has 10 minutes um, to spill quickly what it was like, uh, what happened, and what I'm doing today. And, uh, you know, my goal in coming into Alcoholics Anonymous uh, one day at a time is to stay sober and everything else that follows after that, including, um, you know, living better and living rightly towards the people that are important to me. That gets to be, you know, a good after effect. But, you know, being in the first year of sobriety, again, and it's not the first time at eight months, um, it really is, a you know, a daily goal of staying sober and trying to do things the best that I can do them. And this program has taught me a lot in regards to that. So uh, quickly, uh, what it was like, well, I learned in working the first step and finally having it nailed into my head after continual relapses, like it said, and more about alcoholism after brief periods of recovery, followed by still worse relapse, that I just simply cannot drink like a normal human being. Um, and I really tried to fight that, and I really fought it in a lot of ways for a lot of years, almost 20 years, um, and I did all the, you know, textbook things, like change from hard liquor to beer, uh, and that didn't work. You know, I did the things like swearing off for certain periods. That didn't work. Um, everything I tried to do didn't work. And then not only, you know, trying to control my drinking, but trying to exchange my external life, you know, changing jobs or having a different set of attitudes, right? Maybe um, what does the book say that our, our morals and our values necessarily couldn't even save us from alcoholism? So trying to be a better husband or trying to be a better son or trying to be a better worker or all the things that I would put all my willpower into did not stop me um, from drinking. And it got worse and worse. And for me, uh, you know, the bottom, I mean, the last summer I drank myself into dehydration. And that was probably the worst it got for me physically. Um, but mentally, it was it was a hot mess and um, struggled with maybe three or four uh, drinking related manic episodes. Um, and, and, and really struggled with it and, and didn't see it as a problem and, and didn't really understand what was going on. Um, I know today that I can't take a drink no matter what and that if I do, I can't stop. And um, simply for me, it, it will end in jails, institutions, or death. Uh, but, you know, to have a good life and to enjoy life without alcohol does not seem easy. Uh, and what it came what it came to for me after four years of being in the program and thinking that I had got it and working the steps and then always opting out of something. So the first time around it was, I'm not going to sponsor people. I'm not, I'm not capable of doing that. I didn't have a good enough experience. Um, I don't have any message to carry. I can't help anybody. So I was always opting out of something. You know, the second time around, uh, I didn't have time, right? Because I had gotten a bigger life. I suddenly had a career, uh, you know, I had things that I had never had. I had money, you know, things that I had never had. And so I didn't have time and I couldn't make the time. And so I always opted out and I would do things like, you know, slowly essentially commit suicide by doing things like resigning service commitments, which for me is slowly committing suicide as I'm backing away from Alcoholics Anonymous. And so, no, I know today I can't do things like that. Uh, you know, but what it came down to after another relapse and, and just kind of like, Hiding out in the rooms and not being totally surrendered was having to just say, enough, I have to stop and I have to have a spiritual experience and seek it by any means necessary, and I surrender to the first drink. Um, I surrender to the first drink, and that opens me up in a place where I can do the entirety of the rest of the work that I have to do. Then I'm open to having a spiritual experience. Uh, and uh, what's really 
what's really been the the change for me this time around, what I think is what keeps me sober, is I could talk all day long about inventories and about my my you know my understanding of the first step. What I think keeps me sober and what has changed me spiritually is having a different attitude towards service and towards human beings in general. You know, for three or four years in this program, I was still looking inwards. I was still basically suffering from an overactive ego or overinflated sense of self. This is about me. What do I get? How do I feel better? How do I solve my problems? Um, and so when I was oriented towards the world in that way, I was always thinking about myself. And it was really hard to, like, grow and change and experience any kind of, like, humility or anything necessary for spiritual growth. So what's slowly been changing and, you know, two steps forward, one step back, is I'm slowly starting to think about other people and what I can give. Um, and the first place I can do that is being willing, like, to sponsor. Um, and so I'm always attempting to do that. And then that is something that I never thought I would be able to do or wanted to do. But it's it's something that I do. So the other things that I can do, because I can't really come at Alcoholics Anonymous and say, like, and, like, beeline it to people and say, like, I'm going to be your sponsor or, you know, enforce myself on people. I have to come with the attitude of just being, like, helpful and useful and, and talking to people and getting to know them. Because I'm not entitled to, like, sponsor anybody or, like, take anybody through the steps. And from my experience, like, that doesn't always happen that way. But if I come with the attitude of, like, being connected and helpful and useful to other people then I get that relief from that bondage of self. Um, so there's like a lot of other ways that I can do that. You know, I can call the alcoholic who's still suffering, whether they're a newcomer, you know, but they can also be like that person that I see that kind of like, maybe they're like stuck on their fourth step and you know they've been stuck on their fourth step for five or six months. Or maybe they're the person that kind of like sits in the back and you know them, right? You know them, but you know, you, could, you, know, you don't know if anybody else is calling them. So make the effort to go out and call that person because they may be suffering. When I start to take those kind of actions, like I have a perspective shift or a kind of personality change that is conducive to my recovering from the disease of alcoholism. Like everything else I do beyond that, like I could do inventories to death. I can read the big book to death. I can sit in a million and one meetings. Essentially at a certain point for me, just turns into like um, an intellectual exercise. But when I live this program, like, oriented towards helping other people, I get the change. So it's happened for me in, in the 12-step. And so, you know, we all know there's a million and one ways to do that. You know, sitting in that same seat every week at that same meeting, right? You know, regardless of whether there's a basketball game or whatever. Like, these things, you know, make a big difference. And it has made a big difference for me to just, like, show up and be here to continue to do this deal because I can't do it on my own willpower. Like, on my own, like... I'm a hot mess. Like, but with this program, like I get a chance to stand up here, live and be sober, you know, daily. And I'm really, really grateful for that. So thank you. Thank you, Daryl. My name is Rebecca. I'm an alcoholic. Hi, I want to welcome anyone who is new to Alcoholics Anonymous or coming back. Anyone who thinks that they might have a problem with alcohol and is just checking it out, um, you're in the right place. If um, you're contemplating that question, you probably do. So this is the right place to be. My sobriety date is February 20th, 2009. On February 19th, it was not an extraordinary day. Nothing major happened. There was no giant blowout, no major epiphany, nothing really totally out of the usual. Um, I was in a pretty dark place and my life pretty much sucked. And, uh, the trajectory I was on was going to continue in that way. And I didn't see any way out whatsoever. I did not, um, understand that there might be another way to do things. And I will get to February 20th um, later on, but February 19th was no special day whatsoever. It was just full of misery. It was dark. It was bleak. And that was the way my life had been, and that was the way it was going to continue to go. In my opinion, I saw no other way. Uh, I was, I'll backtrack to the beginning, and I'll tell you a story. 
about a person named Rebecca. And um, I say it's a story because it's just the story. It's the story of what happened. Everything that I assigned to the what happened part is the shit that caused me a lot of pain. The story part is just the story. It's what happened. It's the facts. I assigned a lot of reasons. I assigned a lot of meaning, most of it negative, about the things that happened. The facts of my life are that I was born in a small town in New Mexico to uh, the daughter of a colonel. (coughs) She had two kids already. Um, Both kids were seven and eight. She had had them um, at age uh, 17 and 18. She was a single mom. She was making her way, and she met a married man and got knocked up and had me. So she was, you know, making the best of it. Her mom had just died of untreated breast cancer. Um, She was very stoic and what I was told, a cold woman. And um, after my grandmother died, who I had never met, um, my mom was living in my in my grandfather's house and her dad's house. And within the year he had met a new woman and was going to remarry. And she was asked to leave with her now three children. So I was now born and, um, there she was 28, 27, somewhere around there, three kids, uh, no meaningful way to earn a living. And, um, she was pretty destitute. Um, she made the best of it. My brother um, was nine years old when he was sent away. My sister left at 16. I left at 14. So we were all pretty desperate to get out of there. Um, I'll go into that a little bit later. My first memory, I was laying in my crib. I had a bottle. My bottle was not giving me enough. (laughs) I wasn't getting enough out of it. It just was not working for me. I was like two years old. I had this idea, and this is so vivid. It's so weird to remember this so vividly, but I had this idea. If I could just get the scissors and cut a little bigger hole, I'm going to get what I need out of this bottle. So... I thought it through. I was like, well, if I fuck this up, my bottle's over. Mom's not getting me another one because, you know, that's it. It'll it'll be ruined. I will have no more bottle. So I got to be really careful. So I made my way, found the scissors, carefully attempted to get what I needed, get my needs met. And I fucked it up. I fucked the nipple up. I cut it right off. And I was like, I mean, I clearly remember this, like, you are so stupid. You knew that you were going to mess this up and you, and you did it anyway. All right. Well, there you go. You're going to have to like live with this. This is my rationale. You're going to have to live with this. You're going to have to get smarter. You're going to have to figure out how to really take care of yourself. Cause obviously the adults are not here to help you and you obviously aren't capable of taking care of yourself, but now you've, you know, messed your bottle up. So figure out how to deal with it. So I took the bottle back to my crib and I clamped my teeth down on it. And I was like, damn it. I laid down with it. I was like, can I make this work? And of course not. You know, it, it went everywhere and I was super bummed and that was it. No more bottle. So a lot happened in that five minutes. I now knew I wasn't quite smart enough and capable enough. I knew my needs weren't going to get met by the people around me. I knew I was on my own, and I knew I had to get a lot smarter. So I proceeded with the rest of my childhood this way. I don't recall if my mom was um, drinking or using yet. I don't recall this until she met um, Ray Hoover. Soon after the bottle incident, um, he was very charismatic Scorpio who drove a, a, a car called the white, what was it called? The white stallion. Yeah. <laughs> the white stallion. And it was like some like old mobile, like four door, like super 
cool car, and he was a drug dealer. And um, they hit it off pretty well. And I remember one of my tasks was to take the little seeds out of the pan of plant matter. (laughs) So that was my task. And I did a really good job at it because, you know, I like to do very small and, (laughs) yeah, OCD a little bit, maybe. I don't know. Um, But he... I don't know. You know, that was like, that was my new reality. I have a memory of being um, put to sleep in the back seat um, on a very comfortable bed that was probably, in my memory, I think it was on top of a drug shipment. And I think that that was their cover, was to have a baby sleeping. This was before seatbelts and car seats, by the way. Um, I know I don't look that old. Um, so some other weird things happened. The, this this house that they moved into out in the country, it was a very like creepy old ranch house. And my brother, sister, and I were left out there before they had moved their furniture in. And we were left alone. And I remember being so scared just terrified. There was no electricity and we're out there and I didn't know when the parents were coming home. And, um, there was a lot of that being left alone stuff, a lot of wait in the car for me, a lot of, um, my mom working nights as a bartender and leaving me to make my own dinner and put myself to sleep. And the smell at 2 40 AM of cigarettes and alcohol. And I knew my mom was home and it was a joyous occasion when I smelled that smell. So I spent a lot of time in bars as a little kid, um, begging quarters off of patrons to play Donkey Kong and Miss Pac-Man Galaga. Um, got pretty good at those and bars were kind of like that's where I ate dinner a lot of time happy hour it's like a lot of chips and salsa a lot of um chili con queso which I still love a lot and um I don't know bars bars were like my second home it it wasn't a foreign thing to me and the smell of alcohol the smell of cigarettes it, it was all like pretty comfortable (sighs) some of the things I remember as a kid were that I had to make sure that my mom was okay. I had to make sure that she remembered to come and tuck me in because if she forgot to, you know, I didn't know if I would survive the night. So I would leave her notes around the house. Mom, please don't forget. Come and tuck me in after you get home. Um, There was a time when I woke up and I could tell she had been home, but she wasn't home. And I thought, oh no, maybe she's dead. That was my first thought. And I called the cops and they came and I was home alone and they were questioning me and my mom walked in. Oh yeah. She was not happy. (laughs) Do not call the cops. I got in a lot of trouble. You know, she thought I knew the routine. She'd be home. I just had to chill. But I was really scared um, of that idea that maybe she she wasn't okay and that maybe um, I hadn't done a good enough job of taking care of her. I don't remember her drinking. Um, I know she had a beverage at all times and it usually had diet soda and I thought it tasted terrible anyway. So I didn't go to try to drink it often. The times I did, I was pretty grossed out by it. So I didn't really do that a lot, but she always had this large plastic cup of beverage. And I'm guessing now that maybe it, there was alcohol in it. Um, it would all add up the fact that she chose to be a bartender with a eight year old daughter at home and, um, leave her at home alone to go work. I mean, I respect the fact that she was trying to make her ends meet, but, um, I also think that that was a fairly reckless, um, approach to child raising. I forgive her now. I really do. 
Um, yeah, a lot of self-reliance. One of the things we're really good at is alcoholic self-reliance. We don't like to, I don't like to, um, be uncertain about things. I I'd rather know, I'd rather like know the bad news or create some bad news than have uncertainty about things. You know, this self-reliance is like, look, it's me against the world and fuck everyone else because I'm going to get mine and just get in line because I'm going to shove my way to the front. And that's pretty much how I felt like I had to get along in, in my world. Probably around um, age 13, probably right around puberty. And I think hormones are like a huge turning point in my, um, story. I started trying to alter my reality. And, uh, the first thing I started doing was, um, hyperventilating and cutting off the blood circulation to my head. And I would pass out and I would have these incredible dreams, these like experiences, these like otherworldly places that were really cool and really somewhere where I wasn't. It was not here. And that's all I cared about. I just wanted to be somewhere else. And, um, I started getting in trouble for doing that because I was doing it in the middle of class at school. <laughs> Yeah. So I got sent to the nurse's office and I got talked to like, what's going on? Are you sick? Do you have epilepsy? Like what the heck's going on? And I, I just, I started lying, you know, it was like, I had to lie to hide this thing that made me feel better. The first intervention I had, you guys, I was six years old. I'm not shitting you. I was a sugar addict out of the gate and my mom sat me down and she said, I think you have a problem. And I was like, oh God, I've got to get better at hiding this. <laughs> and I did. I got better. I had a circuit of old ladies around my neighborhood. <laughs> I had Esther, I had Mrs. Rogers, and then I had this other family down the street and they all had sugar and they all had TV and, you know, some had color TV, some had black and white. Mrs. Rogers used to make me weed in her garden, but she always baked cookies. So that was cool. Like I, you know, it was like, depending on the day, I was like, where was I going to go get my fix? And I, yeah, I used sugar as a drug. That was, you know, that was really my first way of escaping. It made me feel good. It still does. <laughs> it's, I have a love hate relationship with it now because it's, it's very much still alive as like an addictive substance in my life. And, and I, I work steps around it and it's still there. I, it persists. I don't know. It's not killing me at the moment. So. I think I'll be all right. Um, yeah. So using, using started young, altering my way of feeling started young. When I discovered alcohol, um, that was a pretty phenomenal feeling. I remember the sense of inhibition being lifted. And I could now be who I always knew I was, which was free. I remember the Rocky Horror Picture Show. That that was like pivotal. I saw people dressing crazy and acting wild and having fun. And I thought, that's what I want. That's what I need. I need some way to like bust out and like let go. I was so tightly wound and so like trying to like hang on to everything, make sure, you know, I fed myself in the morning, got myself some lunch for school, got myself to school, got home from school, did my homework. Like it was all up to me. I had, I didn't feel like I had a lot of support or oversight and that amount of, of wound tightness, um, really resulted in 
these behaviors, these coping mechanisms that allowed me to escape. And alcohol was very freeing. It was the most freeing out of anything I had found thus far. And um, I drank vodka and orange juice um, was my first real drunk. I had snuck wine at the Thanksgiving dinners um, and felt pretty good. But the first real like honest to goodness drunk was vodka and OJ. And it was phenomenal. It felt so good and it tasted so good. And I felt so bad. I was just being bad. And I liked that. (laughs) There were some, you know, kind of bad behaviors that started happening out of that. My cousin and I snuck out of her house and we went and like, you know, knocked on people's windows in the middle of the night, like probably not so smart, but we wanted to, I don't know, wake people up. I'm not sure what the goal was. I think we were looking for her, the boy that she had a crush on. I think we were looking for his house, but we didn't find it and ended up knocking on other people's windows. And that kind of madness continued, like just really not being um, conscious of what, what was happening and what consequences there might be. That was really pretty clear. The first time I blacked out was at a, a party in New Mexico. It's a very rural state. Let me just paint a picture about it. It's like empty. There's like a million people in the whole state. You arrive there and you think there's been a nuclear bomb because there's like nobody. The streets are empty. There's no one walking. You're like, where is everyone? It's so nice. There's like hardly any humans there. But we used to party in vacant fields and arroyos, which is where water runs out when you have a flash flood. We used to party um, up in the mountains. We would go out into the desert We would find abandoned, you know, shacks and old ruins. (laughs) That's where we partied. We had names for all these places. And if you hung around the town square long enough, you would find out where the keg was going and you would follow a long line of cars and get lost for like two hours and then finally find the party. And there was a lot of Drinking and driving, because there's a lot of driving in order to get places out there. And you can't really do it without drinking. So the first time I got super duper duper smashed, I remember getting a lot of attention because I was so obnoxious and so inconsolable and laughing and crying and screaming and telling people I love them and vomit all over myself. And it was quite a picture I'm sure and now that I look back on it I can see this like young girl needing attention getting it any way she could and it was not a a pretty picture after I got home that night um, the cops had arrived at that abandoned house and someone threw me over their shoulder and carried me out of there I mean it could have been anyone luckily it was a friend um And I got showered and I guess he washed my clothes and I got taken home. But really like that's a miracle. The fact that that was a friend who helped me was a miracle because it could have gone in any way possible. And, you know, only a guardian angel, um, would know that, that that probably shouldn't have gone that way. When I arrived home, my mother uh, was pretty clear I had been drinking, and when she squeezed me a little too hard in her embrace, I vomited again (laughs) and had got sent to bed and woke up with the worst hangover, and that hangover was the story of my life. Every fucking time I drank, I was so sick the next day, just so sick. I could not figure out how to not get a hangover. I tried everything. If I think if I could have figured out how to not be hung over the next day, I might've kept going, but I was so ill every morning. 
of most of my life because from that day on, I figured out how I could start drinking every day. It wasn't long after that drunk that I left home. Um, I like to tell people for many, many years that she kicked me out of the house. But as I was um, cleaning her house a few years ago, I found uh, the letter that I left that said that I was out of there. It said, I need to go out there on my own and I need to figure out, you know, who I am without your control. And I was two weeks shy of 14 and I left and it was not fun for the first little while. Um, when I first got to my sister's place in Boulder, Colorado, it was Halloween and that's about an eight hour drive North. I shaved a mohawk because my mom hadn't let me prior. So I shaved a mohawk. I dyed it red. And my sister took me to my first real honest punk rock party. And I was in love. I was like, this is it. I've arrived. <laughs> there were other Mohicans. And now I felt like a total poser. Because I'm like, <laughs> oh, my God. I'm so stupid. Like, these are the real punk rockers. And here I am, like, total poser. So I made a decision. Okay, I got I to gotta toughen up real quick here. You know, this is like, this is time. This is it. I'm running with the big dogs now. I've got to, like, yeah. get my shit straight. So I did. Figured that out pretty quick. And uh, by this time, you know, I was supposed to be going to eighth grade still. And that was rough. Like, trying to get to school at 730 in the morning or whatever ridiculous time they asked you to be there. It was really hard. And I didn't make it very often. And I started um, having more access to drugs and alcohol. And this is like, it just goes on and on and on like this. It's, there's so much of this that I'm not going to bore you with it. I just want to paint the picture of like, this is how it went for me. It was like every opportunity I could, I, I made the decision. I'm going to figure out how to, you know, make this, you know, work for me. And there was uh, a lack of resources. So I had to, you know, beg, borrow, steal barter, if you will, for what I needed. And, um, as long as I could get drunk or high every day, it was pretty manageable. It was pretty manageable. I just needed to take the edge off. I just needed to numb out a little over the years. I guess I grew smarter. I guess I grew more experience. I guess I grew more adept at taking care of myself. And although I didn't finish school, I didn't finish eighth grade. Um, never did go back to get a GED, never went to college, um, have taken advanced studies and such, you know, in things that I'm interested in. And luckily I like to read. So I did a lot of that, but the amount of, I guess, agility at, at trying to navigate, um, the world, the amount of agility that I could get was, a, was kind of like how I propelled my life forward. I eventually started getting real paying jobs and able to support myself and able to get real places to live. But for much of my life, I lived in cars. I squatted houses. I, um, lived on people's couches and, um, you know, did just did whatever I needed to do in order to survive. And it wasn't like that always, you know, eventually I learned how to make a living and all this stuff, but alcohol was still there and the hangovers were still there every morning. And it was challenging to try to get up to go to work feeling so sick. And I got fired from many, many jobs because of that. Eventually I, I moved around a lot, but eventually I moved here, uh, for the second time in 2000. And by this time I had already been, um, arrested for a domestic violence 
I was a pretty angry, violent drunk. Um, I like to fight. I like to, um, pick fights with boys and, um, I wasn't shy about confrontation or conflict. Like I felt so much anger and rage. If you were able to match me, bring it. I I wanted that release. I wanted to feel something. And yet the consequences of that were horrible. You know, uh, the shame, the despair, the hurt, the sadness, the remorse, and then ultimately the, you know, uh uh-oh, that was you know, that was where I lived. Oh shit. What did I do? You know, like that's not going to work out so well for me. In 2000, I moved here. Um, I knew I had a problem with alcohol I mean, that was clear. I'd known that for a really long time. I thought if I moved here, maybe I could stop drinking. And I got a job up um, on Haight Street and I lasted, I think about three weeks, I was stealing from the place. And I I was like, man, I'm going to go to jail. I am going to go to jail. If I keep this up, I better quit. (laughs) Not I better stop stealing, I better quit. (laughs) So I quit. (laughs) And, um, I had to pay back the money that they had given me to transfer me out here. And I got a job waiting tables at a, um, a brewery in downtown Berkeley. And, um, I think I made it through one shift and at the end of the shift, they handed me a beer and I was like, so much for that. (laughs) It, it was, I had zero defense zero defense against the first drink. I wanted to so bad not to drink every morning. I would wake up, please let me not drink today, please. Just today, today, I'm not going to drink. Okay. That's it. Really today. Not going to drink every morning. And I, I couldn't, it was impossible. My friend Sadie, I knew she was in the program and I called her up crying one day and I was like, I think I have a problem. And she's like, would you like to go to a meeting? I was like, not really. (laughs) I just want you to tell me how to stop. And she's like, well, why don't you come to a meeting with me? I was like, oh, okay, (laughs) fine. So she took me to a women's meeting, and I just thought it was so weird. (laughs) It was so disturbing. Everyone was so nice and happy and, like, (laughs) sitting around a circle and there was like this sense of maybe everything's going to be okay. And then this sense of just deep shame and despair. Like, I can't believe I might be an alcoholic. It was like a death sentence, but not the kind of death sentence that I know it is now. It was like the kind of death sentence where like my fun is over. That's it. You know, there's no more fun. Life is going to suck from here on out. And And I cried and cried and cried like so obnoxiously through that whole meeting. And at the end, all these really nice ladies gave me their number and I thought they were hitting on me. (laughs) I really did. I really, really did. I thought it was like code word for like lesbian meeting, like women's meeting. (laughs) So of course I didn't really call anyone. I was so like, whoa, wigged out by it all. And I kept drinking and I kept going on and on and on (laughs) that way. (laughs) Thank God. (laughs) Okay. So fast forward two marriages later (laughs) and the first one, uh, was a sober guy. And I thought, this is it. (laughs) I'm going to get sober now. I'll, I'll hang out with this guy and then I'll be sober. And I white knuckled it for probably about six months. Um, that was a mistake. Boy, that guy, whew, that was really rough. That was, um, that was a, a bottom. <laughs> that was definitely a low point in my life. And I didn't drink for six months. So I knew something was 
I knew there was something, there was definitely some way that I didn't have to do it. And that wasn't going to be it. And by the end of our relationship, I was drinking six packs of O'Doul's and I was smoking cigarettes again. Hmm. And, and, you know, as soon as I kicked him out finally for the last time, because he would not get a job nor collect cans. Like I told him he should, (laughs) or, um, at least collect cans. I mean, come on. I respect those people out there recycling more than, you know, someone who sits on the couch all day eating my food. (laughs) Yeah. So I started drinking again. And what I did was I went to the store and I bought a 12 pack, a bottle and um, some vitamins (laughs) because I knew it was on. I was like, yep, here we go. I better, you know, fortify myself with some vitamins to make sure I, you know, can handle this. And that was it. I met my next husband a couple weeks later. (laughs) I know, I know. It's bad. I'm a little embarrassed to tell you this, but um, I did. I met him two weeks later in a bar. And um, he never called me out on how much I drank. I was like, cool. This is awesome. Okay. But I could drink more than he could. And he was a little bit sloppy of a drunk. And I was like, Oh no, that's not good. I don't want to have to babysit, you know, like, (laughs) but I went along with it anyway. And within a year, a year, within a year, within six months, I was divorced six months from that exact date. I was married again. And Uh, we had this like really beautiful alcoholic life together and, um, it was fabulous. You know, um, we looked great together. We partied hard. We went to all the shows and concerts and car shows and, you know, a lot of kind of glorified drunken fighting and loud sex and, you know, lots of like horrible things that, to me were glamorous. Like that was like my glamorous life was like this very, I thought I had arrived. Um, but slowly the, the wheels fell off, you know, like within a year, like we were, we were running on flats, uh, down the freeway. And, um, I was afraid I might kill him to be honest with you. He was such, so provocative to me and he would provoke the rage. And I thought to myself, you know what? I might honestly commit homicide here. Um, He would get in my face and, and let me know that he could hit me at any moment if he wanted to. And I thought, you know what? I could just kill you. Like, you don't scare me. I, I could, and I will, if you make me. And that was the moment when I was like, okay, yeah, this is not good. So knowing that he was the problem and it wasn't me, I went to (laughs) Al-Anon and, um, I walked into the wrong meeting at the wrong time. And I sat down and somebody said, if you don't want to drink again, you don't have to stick around. We'll show you how. And I was like, what? Where am I? Oh, no. Oh, no. I'm in the wrong meeting. Oh, God. I am in the wrong meeting. And I stayed because I believed them. I thought maybe this is true. So I continued um, to sit there and listen. And by the end of that meeting, I had a sense of hope tiny glimmer, tiny itty bitty little glimmer. And after the meeting ended, I kicked some rocks in the corner until someone came up and talked to me. And the minute, um, he opened his mouth, I started crying and he said, hold on, let me get my wife just a minute. I was like, yeah. So, um, thank God for, for that man. Thank God for his wife. Um, I don't remember what happened the rest of that night. I think I went out and fellowshiped with some like, um, middle class, older white Berkeley people who I couldn't relate to, but I knew they were sober and I 
thought maybe I'll try not to drink tonight. I'll give this a shot. And I'll see if I don't have to drink tonight. And I didn't. I didn't drink that night. And the next day I woke up and I actually didn't have a hangover for the first time in a really long time. And I went to a meeting that day and I met some people and I went out and fellowshiped with them. And that proceeded to happen over and over and over. I would go to a meeting and I wouldn't drink in between. I got phone numbers. I would call people. I continued to pursue this thing that was not take a drink today, no matter what. And I was able to do that over and over with enough days that I started having a perspective shift. And that perspective shift was one that had me able to see my life, not as um, a victim, but as a person who attempted to create um, circumstances with which I could tolerate. And that perspective shift continued to expand and open up. And over time, I've been able to see much larger um, places in my life that uh, the perspective I had held before was just very as askew. It was off. It was not the truth. It was a warped perspective. So the kind of that shift in my thinking um, they talk about in the big book as like this jettisoned into the fourth dimension or something like that. And and I really feel for me, it was really about this, a way of viewing myself, the world and my life um, from the perspective of I created this. These were my character defects that I learned how to use strategies to then um, survive. And those strategies for survival have kept me alive. And I am here today uh, because I finally was able to create a new strategy called, I'm going to admit I'm an alcoholic. Finally, it's not going to um, kill me to say I'm an alcoholic. There's no shame in saying I'm an alcoholic. What that's going to do for me is it's going to free me up. I'm going to have that weight lifted off my shoulders. I no longer have shame about that. I can now be useful. I'm no longer a tornado leaving a wake of disaster. I am now somebody who can provide use, service. I can hopefully um, enable other people to see that you don't have to drink today. You can go a few days, you can create years without a drink. You can move through life in a new way with a different perspective than you once held. I have a sponsor. She's been my sponsor since the very beginning. Um, I have a bunch of sponsees right now. I am praying that um, my higher power handles my schedule in such a way that everyone can get what they need. <laughs> In myself included, I oftentimes am turning things over because I don't know what to do. I don't know how it's going to work out. I don't know, you know, how I'm going to be taken care of. I, I don't know. And I'm tired of trying to figure that out myself. It's really exhausting. So I've learned this thing. It's really easy. You say, okay, I don't know what to do. God goddess, higher power, whoever you are, please help me. Please show me how to do this. Please guide me through this process and let me try to be of use uh, during all of this and get out of my own head. And if I do that enough times, it's like things are working out. I have um, a career. I'm an eighth grade dropout. You guys like, I, I don't, I didn't know I could make money. Um, doing a skill that I really enjoy. I don't have a boss. I work for myself. I make my own hours. I have my own apartment. I drive my own car. It's paid for. I, you know, I don't, uh, I didn't borrow it from someone and never return it like I've done before. 
there's a lot of things that are completely out of the realm of what I knew was possible for myself. And, um, nine years ago, I would not have guessed that I'd be here today sober. Like that was not, that was not going to happen. Um, so I am now really happy to call myself an alcoholic. To me, it means that I have a new ability to survive. And it's now it's kind of like, it's no longer just surviving for survival sake. It's like, what can I do today to leave a, a better mark than all the trash and refuse that I left in my week before? Thanks. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.